And uh, our speaker today um, is Robinson Woodward Burns. Dr. Woodward Burns is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Howard University. He's a scholar of American constitutional thought and development. His research focuses on civil rights, federalism, slavery, abolitionism, and transcendentalism. He holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, MA from the University of Maryland, and BA from the College of William and Mary. As the description of his research uh, indicates, he works on a remarkably broad set of topics. And to convince you of this further, I just want to flag two articles that might be of interest uh, to those here, but especially because they might not seem immediately related to what he'll be talking about today. Uh, and they're, they're related. The first is a 2016 piece in Polity titled Solitude Before Society, Emerson on Self-Reliance, Abolitionism, and Moral Suasion. The second is a forthcoming piece in uh, the journal of Politics called Rethinking Self-Reliance, Emerson on Mobbing, War, and Abolition. I think that piece is doubly amazing because he snuck it in just before the GOP stopped publishing political theory. So congratulations, Robinson. Um, today, he'll be talking about his forthcoming book, uh, Hidden Laws, How State Constitutions Stabilize American Politics. And that will be published by Yale University Press, I believe at the end of June. Um, I can drop a link in the chat so we can all be sure to pre-order it. The title of his talk today is the same as that book, Hidden Laws, How State Constitutions Stabilize American Politics. With that, I will turn it over to Robinson. Thank you very much, Connor, for that exceedingly, exceedingly kind introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to thank Connor for reaching out to me about this. Uh, I'd like to thank the Kinder Institute faculty and organizers for the invitation as well and for the audience for joining. I see some familiar faces here, which is always a pleasure. Uh, and as Connor said, today I'll be presenting some work from my forthcoming book, Hidden Laws, How State Constitutions Stabilize American Politics. I'd like to begin with a ritual that political science uh, scientists do. I'd like to start with a puzzle. Um, the United States boasts the world's first and oldest national constitution. Stability defines the documents. Uh, Americans have ratified 27 amendments out of the 11,970 proposed amendments. They've never convened to replace the constitution and only rarely radically or fundamentally reinterpreted it through judicial, judicial review. Over the last 230 years, the uh, Constitution has weathered a civil war and more recently, for the first time, an attempted coup d'etat. So why is this? Why has the document survived these tests? Why is it such an outlier in terms of longevity? I argue that state constitutional revision resolves national constitutional controversies that uh, the state constitutional revision preempts or prevents national reform. By shifting controversy to the states, we destabilize state constitutionalism while stabilizing national constitutionalism and stabilizing national politics generally. And so we'll try to defend or elaborate this claim in three parts. First, I'll offer a theory of what constitutional change looks like in the United States. And then I'll try to give two examples in support of this process. I'll talk a little bit about the 19th Amendment for female suffrage, which did pass, and the Equal Rights Amendment uh, forbidding sex discrimination under the federal or state constitutions, which did not. So let's talk a little bit about how constitutionalism works. I argue that by decentralizing conflict, we see the national constitution over time is stabilized. Now to think about why this is, it, it might be helped, uh, helpful to think about what constitutions do. Liberal constitutions do at least two things. Constitutions durably entrench rules against reform, committing actors to the same goals, durably binding these actors. But these constitutions also authorize the people to reform these rules, to rework these constitutional um, bindings. These two aims, promising both stability and flexibility, are opposed. Now, in the American context, we see this tension at work. New growing or excluded groups may petition for a national constitutional reform or amendment, but rarely do these groups clear the federal uh, amendment requirements. Article five of the constitution requires bicameral congressional supermajorities and then three quarters of the states. It's virtually impossible to get an amendment past these thresholds. Uh, and it's similarly hard to pass sweeping landmark federal statutes or to oust entrenched judicial elites, 
The Constitution, therefore, often remains unchanged, whether by amendment or by statutory reworking or by judicial reinterpretation. And so the gap between evolving civic aspirations and entrenched legal realities, which plagues all constitutions, especially plagues the United States Constitution with its exceptionally high barriers to amendment. Note that the US Constitution has the highest bars to amendment of any national constitution in the world. Unable to adapt by amendment or to flexibly be uh, or quickly reinterpreted, the Constitution is sometimes turned against itself, interpreted against itself. The Constitution's extreme inflexibility then is a liability for the document survival. So I return then to the original question, how despite this has the Constitution survived for all these years? My book argues that this democratic pressure for reform filtered through a process I called conflict decentralization yields state constitutional reform. Conflict decentralization describes how the states address and resolve national constitutional controversies. So how exactly does conflict decentralization work? Uh, there are a few clauses in the constitution that create broad overlapping powers that are shared by both the federal and state governments. These clauses are pretty brief and this brevity allows elites, reformers, judges, members of Congress, broad interpretive leeway to construct and often to enlarge or expand the overlap between federal and state power in ways that allow these actors to, to strategically channel nationally salient issues, national constitutional controversies down to the states. I think that this logic of conflict decentralization can you be boiled down to four paths, right? These are ideal types. They're sort of theoretical uh, understandings of how conflict results in constitutional change in the United States. I think that our options look sort of like this. Constitutional controversy can emerge at the national level or the state level, and it can yield reform at the national level or the state level. So we get four paths, either national pressure emerges and forces national reform, or national pressure emerges and forces state reform, or state pressure emerges and forces national reform, or finally, state pressure emerges and forces state reform. Now, it's worth considering each of these in turn, these four paths. We'll talk a lot in, a, in greater, uh, much greater detail today about two of them, uh, but it's worth sort of working out exactly how we vent constitutional controversy in the United States in a way that has let the Constitution survive for nearly two and a half centuries. Um, so first let's talk about when national controversy emerges and it yields national reform. We can think of times when, for example, members of Congress or federal judges debate change. There are a few ways that this might result only in national change. In cases of exclusion, the federal government will maintain powers expressly granted only to the federal government and denied to the states, keeping a national controversy national and yielding only national reform. Congress, for example, has the power to make war treaties and post offices and excludes that power from the states. Uh, now, there are only a few exclusive national powers. The states had the lion's share of power at the framing uh, at, uh, in the years in which the uh, Constitution was framed. As a result, many powers are sort of uh, constructed in ways that, uh, if they're claimed as federal powers, are uh, written or interpreted to exclude state intervention. So think, for example, about how judges might interpret uh, parts of the Constitution, like the Supremacy Clause or the Commerce Clause, granting Congress uh, exclusive power to regulate uh, interstate commerce, how federal judges have interpreted these clauses in ways that muscle out the states and allow only federal reform. This kind of reform, though, where federal controversy yields only federal reform is, again, pretty rare. There's just not a lot in the Constitution that says that the states can never act. So let's talk about what it looks like when the states actually engage in constitutional reform and what that might do for our national constitution. In cases where we see national controversy emerge and for state reform, we can see a few kinds of patterns opening up. Uh, sometimes federal actors will essentially punt on divisive issues. They'll passively leave national controversies to the states. And the states have broad regulatory powers to deal with things like elections, under the election clause, they can design Republican governments under the guarantee clause, and they can do anything related to the regulation of health, safety, morals, uh, and the uh, securing of the general welfare under the 10th amendment, which also allows the states to do or assume any powers uh, 
not expressly delegated to the federal government and denied to the states. In other cases, we'll see that uh, federal actors will actively dictate state law, effectively forcing the states to address national controversies and their ways that the federal government, uh, particularly through amendments, the 13th, 14th, 15th, 18th, 19th, 24th, and 26th, can override state regulation, particularly on the um, regulation of the vote. This is a really broad set of tools that Congress has to kick controversies down to the state level. Now, national actors, members of Congress, you know, despite what you might think, they're not actually that stupid. Uh, members of Congress act strategically and intelligently. Um, they use these tools of devolution strategically. Reformers blocked by high Article V barriers to amendment, federal judges uh, who may not want to deal with an issue, they'll start looking to the states to essentially take on these constitutional questions. Judges can defer issues to the states using what's called the political question doctrine, so they don't have to touch hot potato issues. You'll note that when the Supreme Court denied the Trump uh, campaign's appeal to overturn state level um, uh, balloting, the courts gave pretty brief uh, responses to the uh, campaign generally, uh, usually saying that this is simply not within their jurisdiction. It's a way essentially of passing off the really toxic or difficult questions. Uh, in Congress, we see something like political maneuvering or, or agenda setting at work, um, divisive issues that might split a caucus in the House or in the Senate can be silenced and left to the states, again, on something like that political question doctrine on the assumption that the states are best able to handle these issues. Um, now, this was, is a fairly common pattern, this pattern of devolution where national controversies get pushed down to the states, but it's not the only pattern, and I want to briefly talk about the last two. Uh, there's a third pattern in which state constitutional controversies gets elevated to force national constitutional reform. Sometimes we see states converging on one or several constitutional policies which federal actors then adopt in response, passing, for example, a harmonizing constitutional amendment at the federal level. For example, and we'll discuss this more later, after the states enfranchised women through state constitutional reform, it became electorally risky for congressmen representing uh, these franchise states to deny the female vote in Congress. Because the states had settled on female enfranchisement through state constitutional reform, they pushed Congress gradually to pass a federal amendment, the 19th Amendment, that recognized this new state level status quo. In other cases, sometimes state level constitutional regulation conflicts and forces federal actors to more actively dictate rather than passively imitate state constitutionalism. So, for example, in the 1850s, discordant state level regulation of slave law uh, forced the Supreme Court and Congress to attempt to enact national slave law. And this was actually a case in which the system of devolution, uh, or rather deference to the states, failed. The states failed to converge, uh, requiring active federal intervention. Uh, in either case, whether we see the states converging or diverging, uh, we can say that the states act as Justice Louis Brandeis famously said. In, uh, case, um, Lieberman, uh, New Ice Company, uh, he said uh, that the states act as laboratories of democracy attempting, quote, uh, novel social and economic experiments. So that's what it looks like when a state issue brings about national constitutional reform. Uh, and I'll argue uh, with the example of the 19th Amendment today that usually when we get national constitutional reform, particularly by amendment, sometimes by judicial reinterpretation, it's really imitation of what the states have already settled on through amending or revising or replacing their own constitutions. This allows the national constitution essentially to, in imitating the states, harmonize with them and prevent sort of radical or untested types of amendments or judicial interpretation. So finally, let's talk about this last path. What happens when state controversy yields only state reform? Sometimes states address and resolve nationally salient issues uh, in ways that preclude federal actors, members of Congress, federal judges from ever considering uh, revising the Constitution or reinterpreting the Constitution. Uh, the states can effectively circumvent or bypass uh, national political actors to address certain issues. Consider, for example, in the Jacksonian era in the 1820s and then really culminating in the 1830s, states uniformly repealed property and taxpaying uh, qualifications on the white male vote. 
this was a really, really nationally contentious issue. But by the 1830s, nearly all states had repealed these uh, franchise, uh, disenfranchisement measures. And this effectively kept this divisive issue out of the halls of Congress uh, in a way that stabilized national constitutionalism. Uh, these sorts of issues are kind of like the dog that didn't bark. If you only read the records from Congress or the federal courts, you'd miss this nationally really important constitutional issue. Um, so those are, I think, the four paths as we see them. Um, now, a kind of final thought about uh, what this actually does. Uh, for the most part, we see the states revising their constitution in response to nationally important issues. And it's pretty easy to change a national constitution. While there are incentives for uh, constitutional reformers to attempt both state and national reform, national reform is again, extraordinarily hard. Remember under article five for an amendment, you need two thirds of uh, a, an amendment convention or both houses of Congress, something nearly impossible now. And then three quarters of state ratifying conventions or legislatures, it's just too high of a bar. And we know from political science research that judges tend to uphold the positions of the people who appointed them. They tend to entrench previous uh, political stances. So it's more likely that you'll get state constitutional change and not national constitutional change. States have the flexibility that the national constitution lacks. All states impose lower bars to amendment and with smaller legislatures can better uh, coordinate to propose revision by amendment or by convention or even by constitutional commission, a tool not available at the national level. In nearly all states, amendment ratification requires only a simple majority of voters. And consequently, two thirds of attempted amendments to standard uh, standing constitutions have passed. Now failing amendment, there's still more ways to change state constitutions. In most states, a simple majority of voters can call a convention to draft a new document 14 states require these votes at least every 20 years, and eight states don't fully describe the procedure for calling a convention. In the past, this was actually even more common, so you'd have frequently extra legal or quasi-legal conventions. And then on top of that, if you can't get an amendment through the legislature or can't call a convention, the public has the ability to call initiatives and referenda to revise their constitution. As a result, half of state constitution making bodies have drafted or ratified new documents. This flexibility does something to state constitutions. It means that state constitutions are in a state of constant flux. Easy revision means that lawmakers pass partisan pork barrel provisions and so state constitutions are longer than the federal document, on average quadruple the length. Alabama's constitution clocks in at 870 uh, thousand words. It's the size of a phone book. I'm pretty sure no one's ever read all of it. This overspecificity has political implications. It means that judges at the state level have less interpretive leeway, which means that people depend more on constitutional amendment, which means that you get even more amendment. And so state constitutions get stuck in this cycle of amendment. And the public doesn't really have a problem with this. The public, to the extent that it's aware that state constitutions exist, and only about half of Americans believe state constitutions exist, they are fine with state constitutional revision. They don't uh, venerate state constitutions the way they do the national document, and so they keep revising them. State constitutions are in this feedback loop where they keep changing, keep getting revised. Uh, it's, it exemplifies something like path dependence, where previous amendments mean we're more likely to get amendments again in the future. As a result, Americans have called 412 state constitutional assemblies, uh, ratified 144 state constitutions, called 256 state constitutional conventions, proposed 11,635 amendments to the standing state constitutions, and ratified 7,695 of these. State constitutions are always changing. State constitutional revision is therefore something like a steady, quiet, constant background process in American politics. Largely unnoticed, uh, scholars, particularly you know, uh, political scientists don't really study state constitutionalism. And I argue that this ongoing process has an effect on national politics. It stabilizes national politics. All of this change addresses something and often addresses nationally salient constitutional issues in ways that prevent national constitutional change and destabilization. Um, so one sort of final set of, of thoughts on, on how we can understand all of this. 
Um, you know, for example, that parties realign so quickly, that periodically and pretty rarely, parties will get bicameral supermajorities that allow them to revise the constitution, to pass sweeping statutes, to rebuild the courts. Think, for example, of Reconstruction or the New Deal period or the Great Society period. Uh, and we get formal national or federal constitutional change. But these are the periods of exception. And more often we have these long stretches in which parties in Congress have roughly equal seat share. We're nowhere close to Article Five Amendment or being able to rebuild the federal courts. This is roughly where we are now. And so to the extent that constitutional change can happen at all, it happens at the state level and only the state level. So we have this pattern in which we get long stretches of deference to the states. If there is a federal change, it's usually imitating state change or following convergence of state policy. Uh, and these long stretches are, are periodically interrupted. There's, there's this punctuation of interruption in which we get these sweeping bicameral supermajorities that can also rebuild the federal constitution. Most change though happens at the state level. Um, so a sort of a, a set of thoughts before we talk about these two cases I wanna explore. This can help us rethink how the national constitution works in some pretty significant ways. You know, often talking about the state constitutions, I'll find there's one person in the audience who studies state constitutions and they love this and everyone else is pretty profoundly bored. And so the onus on me is to show why it actually matters that state constitutional change has been occurring all these years, right? If no one studies it, why should we study it? Uh, and one point I'd like to make is that national constitutional change, national constitutional events, including landmark things like amendments and Supreme Court cases, we've misunderstood pretty fundamentally because we've ignored how they interact with state constitutionalism. So let's think about the federal courts. Uh, there's a famous case in 1966 called Harper versus Virginia Board of Elections. It's a celebrated case in which the Supreme Court outlawed the poll tax. And it did, it, under this case, it made it uh, nationally illegal for states to impose a poll tax in ways that uh, expanded the vote, particularly to black voters in the South. This was a really important decision. By 1966, when Harper was issued, only four states still had the poll tax. Every other state had constitutionally or statutorily repealed the poll tax. And in fact, as states through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, struggled to repeal their poll tax and finally succeeded, the Supreme Court kept upholding the poll tax. It was only after the states had done this heavy lifting and hard work that the Supreme Court affirmed what the states had already done. And so it is true that after this 1966 Supreme Court decision in Harper, the poll tax was outlawed. It was not because of the Harper decision. In fact, it was because of prior state constitutional reform. And this is a broader lesson here. The national constitution may change in text or interpretation after uh, an amendment or after a uh, landmark federal decision, but it may not change because of those things. And one of the things I'll try to demonstrate today is that amendments or these landmark judicial decisions often pass because the Supreme Court, or rather the states, have already changed their constitutions and effectively created a new law nationally, which is merely formalized in a Supreme Court decision or an amendment. One other kind of thought about how we can reinterpret the Constitution. Take two amendments, and we'll do we'll do a sort of dive into voting law for a second here. The Fifteenth Amendment, Section One, forbids disenfranchisement of people on the basis uh, of race. The Twenty Fourth Amendment is another amendment that forbids disenfranchisement on the basis of race. This was an amendment that came alongside the Harper decision, and this amendment outlawed the poll tax. Now the 15th and uh, the 24th amendment, they look pretty textually similar. It looks like they do the same thing. But as I just pointed out, by the mid 1960s, when the 24th amendment passed, states had already gotten rid of the poll tax and they'd locked themselves constitutionally into a prohibition of the poll tax. They constitutionalized, they entrenched nationally a platform that forbade the poll tax. When the 24th Amendment passed alongside Harper, again, the states had gotten rid of the poll tax. Now, the 15th Amendment was passed almost exactly a century before. It passed in 1870. And it looks a lot like the 24th Amendment. It forbids states from disenfranchising people on the basis of race. But this was a very different time and states, particularly some unreconstructed states in the border south, were still attempting racial disenfranchisement, as were a handful of Northern states. 
The 15th Amendment was a uh, an amendment which passed in a world in which some states had already forbidden racial disenfranchisement under their constitutions and others hadn't. And so the amendment did something really different. It forced the states to homogenize. It aggressively proposed uh, a, an important and just federal policy against unwilling states. The 24th Amendment looks a lot like this, but it didn't work that way. And so by studying the history of state constitutional reform, my hope is that we can better understand how amendments pass and what they actually do or did. One final, final thought uh, before we talk about the cases. I think that state constitutionalism makes American politics work. Um, I think, you know, whether you're a leftist or whether you support sort of more right-wing approaches to devolution, in either case, when you have a national blockage, the states are the ones that do the work. Uh, because it's so hard to change the national constitution by amendment, because it's so hard to uh, rework it through uh, landmark statutes or judicial reinterpretation, the only place to look is the states. And because democratic uh, legitimacy at least as we conceive of it in the United States as something like popular authority to change your laws. Because democratic legitimacy requires people be able to change their laws, the only place that can functionally happen on a regular basis is at the state level. And so I think the state constitutionalism makes, um, makes uh, American politics a bit more legitimate. So we'll give two sort of quick examples here about how this works. Uh, one is the 19th Amendment to kind of give you a, a concrete sense of what's going on here. And the other is the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, now the 19th Amendment was first proposed in 1866 uh, or what would later become the 19th Amendment. Uh, this is the amendment that forbids denial of the right to vote by the state or national governments on the basis of sex. Um, now the amendment met a lot of early failures. Uh, Congress passed two amendments, the 14th and 15th, forbidding racial disenfranchisement under respectively sections two and one of those amendments, but refused to pass a female franchise amendment. Uh, and there were broad reasons ranging from misogyny to arguments that not enough states had attempted to enfranchise women. In fact, none had at the time. In an 1884 Senate hearing, Senator George Best of Missouri derided uh, the handful of female suffrage experiments, quote, in the sparsely settled territories of the West, asking, quote, where are their larger cities? And fearing federal dictation of uh, state franchise law, Southern delegates in Congress, Southern members of Congress also forbade or also opposed a female franchise amendment worrying that it would enfranchise black women in the South. So after these regular defeats, uh, suffragettes who had uh, originally uh, organized under the National Woman Suffrage Association founded uh, in uh, 1869 by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, Suffragettes reorganized under a new organization, the National Woman Suffrage Association. Um, and the NAWSA, this new organization, said, well, if we're not going to succeed in Congress, there's only one place to work, and that's the states. In their first national convention, the uh, delegate, uh, an Ohio delegate, Claudia Quigley Murphy, explain, explained, quote, we have found the average legislator in Congress to be but a reflex of the sentiments of his constituents. If we wish for representation at Washington, let us go down to the people and sow the seeds among them. When the NAWSA asked that Theodore Roosevelt support suffrage in his 1908 State of the Union address, Roosevelt famously replied, quote, go get another state. And so they figured out that if they're gonna pass a national amendment, they really need to show that it works at the state level. Seeing, quote, that the amendment will pass when there are enough states, um, Ruth McCormick, the uh, NAWSA Congressional Committee Chair, advocated a 48 state campaign uh, to present, uh, prevent, present uh, 400,000 petitions to Congress, essentially to do the grassroots work through state constitutional reform. In 1916, the NAWSA marched outside of the Republican uh, Party Convention and the Congressional Union, which was affiliated with the NWA, uh, NAWSA, uh, reorganized as this new group, the National Woman Party, uh, National Woman's Party, um, on the premise uh, that um, if there were enough suffrage states, they'd be able to kick out uh, congressional incumbents in those states, effectively strong-arming Congress into passing a female franchise amendment. 
Um, so at this point, Maude Younger, who uh, was one of the leaders of this newly formed group, the NWP, said, uh, quote, one thing we have to teach Mr. Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, and his party, and all onlooking parties, is that the group that opposes national suffrage will lose women's support in 12 great commonwealth states, controlling nearly 100 electoral votes too large a fraction to risk. Slowly, women did start to win the vote through partial or wholesale state constitutional enfranchisement. Meeting at the 1916 NAWSA convention uh, in Atlantic City, Carrie Chapman Catt uh, gathered all of the state level heads in a crowded, stuffy room and put on the wall a giant map of the United States, listing the state by state campaign in which gradually uh, um, the NAWSA would win franchise at the state level through state constitutional reform and mobilized for the full franchise through a federal constitutional amendment. Cat, noting the success of an Illinois law uh, for the franchise, called to, quote, replicate the Illinois law in a number of other states, uh, pairing this with um, uh, in states that were hostile, uh, a more limited call for the vote on things like tax paying or school boards. And then, quote, to assemble 36 and then 48 state divisions to move on Congress with precision. And ultimately, this succeeded. Through uh, regular NAWSA campaigning in states like California, where suffragettes first campaigned by using uh, automobiles, uh, by allying with political machines in Boston, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Chicago, the NAWSA started flipping states to enfranchise women and reform their constitutions to do so. Um, now, this starts to show pretty quick results. Um, they win the presidential vote in 14 states between 1917 and 1919. Woodrow Wilson starts paying attention. Um, as a result, by 1919, um, there are 29 uh, states which allow women to vote in federal elections, accounting for 339 of the 351 electoral college votes. Um, and so, again, by this period, a majority of states are electing members of Congress, are voting for presidential electors uh, in ways that allow the female uh, franchise and allow women to oust, uh, particularly mobilized women, to uh, oust uh, opponents of the female franchise amendment. Uh, and the NAWSA is pretty clear about this. It, it telegraphs its threats to Congress. Um, in December 1917, the NAWSA instructs the newly uh, reconvened 65th Congress to, quote, submit the federal amendment before the next congressional election or face, quote, a compact of state associations willing and ready to conduct such campaigns to effect change in both houses of Congress to ensure the amendment's passage. And the threat works. Members of Congress start to realize that there is a new status quo at the state level. Uh, Texan Congressman Thomas Blanton notes that uh, the proposed uh, reintroduced female suffrage amendment, quote, does not infringe on the rights of the sovereign states because the majority of uh, the interest in the whole people, as he put it, favored enfranchisement. Most of the country favored enfranchisement. California Congressman John Raker gave the numbers. He said, quote, there are 15 states in which women have full suffrage. There are 29 states in which women can vote for president. These 29 states control 306 electoral college votes. They knew the math. And so Congress passes the amendment. Uh, it passes with 41 of the 56 supporting uh, senators coming from female franchise states. So the tactic, which Carrie Chapman Catt sketched out in 1916 succeeds only three or four years later. They are effectively able to force the amendment through Congress by mobilizing at the state level. By the time the 19th Amendment passed, again, female enfranchisement in one form or another was the law of the land. Now, the 19th Amendment does important things that state constitutional amendments don't. It forbids the rollback at the state level of the female franchise, and in that sense was a great victory. It's important to remember, though, that the work was done over the previous decades at the state level by female suffragettes, you know, franchise reformers who were uh, looking first to reform their state constitutions in a way that eventually reduced controversy around the national constitutional amendment. So I'll conclude this talk with a, a kind of short digression on the Equal Rights Amendment. And the Equal Rights Amendment is, is sort of an odd case in that it's both very similar and very different to the 19th Amendment. 
So Alice Paul, who'd worked for the passage of the 19th Amendment, actually is the main driver behind the early uh, attempts to pass an equal rights amendment forbidding gender discrimination under um, uh, the national or state law. Um, but the Equal Rights Amendment never passes. And there's sort of a coda to this, which I'll talk about at the very end. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get uh, ratified by the states, or hasn't been so far. Um, now, Alice Paul leading the National Woman Party uh, in 1921 suggests passing an Equal Rights Amendment, which, again, forbidding gender discrimination under law was one of the original goals of Stanton and Anthony in the mid-1860s. Uh, and in 1923, they get uh, Kansas Senator Charles Curtis to actually sponsor an amendment before Congress. They go directly to Congress, right? They're riding a high from the ratification of the 19th Amendment, and they decide essentially to skip uh, tried uh, to skip mobilizing at the state constitutional level. Um, so what they do is they know that at the state level, there are all these uh, laws protecting um, women specifically in their labor conditions and their working conditions and their working hours and wages. And they realize that fighting state by state to repeal these laws would be pretty difficult. Um, the uh, chair of the uh, NWP's uh, National Advisory Council is a woman named Gail Laughlin, who is a sort of pro-business woman who thinks that these uh, protective measures are belittling to women. So she wants to get rid of them, and they decide to go straight for the National Amendment. But the amendment proves really, really unpopular. Um, trade women's unions are opposed to the amendment. Uh, as Melinda Scott, a United Textile uh, Workers organizer, told the Senate Judiciary Committee in hearings in 1923, quote, the National Woman Party does not know what it is to work 10 or 12 hours a day in a factory, so they do not know what it means to lose an eight-hour day or nine-hour day law. The working women do know. Women's labor groups were opposed to the Equal Rights Amendment because they figured that if it got rid of gender discrimination under the law, it would get rid of their special labor protections. And so through the 1930s, as New Deal pro-labor factions expand in Congress, we see the, N, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment grounds to a halt. Emanuel Seller, uh, he gets elected in the early New Deal. Um, he becomes House Judiciary Chair, and he shuts down debate over an Equal Rights Amendment. So effectively, because the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, doesn't have a carve out for special labor, labor protection, uh, Congress won't consider it. Uh, and the NWP can't fall back on state reform because they hadn't been organizing at the state level. Now, things change in the mid-60s. Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act forbids uh, discrimination in uh, employment on the basis of gender. And states interpret this uh, to avoid their own special protective legislation and start repealing these laws. With the laws gone, labor unions and pro-labor members of Congress have no reason to oppose the ERA. And members of Congress began to reconceive of the ERA as an anti-discrimination measure to protect women in the workplace. And it succeeds. Uh, by the early 1970s, the ERA starts to gather support. In fact, really, this is going on through the entire uh, through the 1960s. Between 1959 and 1971, 414 members of Congress from all 50 states proposed 971 ERAs in the most intense single issue amendment push in US history. And the amendment does pass Congress in 1973 and is sent to the states for ratification. But of course, the amendment never gets ratified. So what exactly happens? This might sort of give us a lesson on, on how state constitutionalism matters. So as the year raised before the states, we also see states passing their own state constitutional amendments. Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Illinois pass uh, equal rights amendments to their state constitutions in 1971. 12 states follow by 1976. Uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Some want to constrain judges and other, wants to, uh, other states want to empower judges. By 1976, 18 states have some form of gender uh, equality clause, including um, older and newer forms of, of, of ERAs. Um, now, this starts to raise the specter that these ERAs empower judges to become judicial activists, effectively, that these will arm judges to start dismantling the traditional family. Um, so, for example, New York State Senator Richard Schmemmerhorn argues, quote, my wife is not equipped to earn her own way. If the state ERA had passed, she would have lost my retirement benefits, my social security benefits, and everything. 
These issues should not be up to the courts and I don't trust judges. I don't want to put the lives and rights of women in the hands of some freaky judge. So this is where uh, we get um, Phyllis Schlafly entering the picture and Phyllis Schlafly seizes on this language. Her uh, campaign against the federal ERA is uh, bolstered by her uh, opposition to state ERAs and she points to failures of state ERAs. States start rejecting ERAs over the sphere of judicial activism. Schlafly points to that as reason to not uh, ratify the federal ERA. And in hearings in the early 19, uh, 1980s, Congress actually points to these state ERAs and says that this would allow federal judicial activism, recognition of same-sex marriage, easier access to abortion uh, in uh, ways that uh, essentially scare off members of Congress. Um, the ERA in 1979, uh, it uh, reaches this period in which a seven year ratification deadline has passed. Congress gives it three more years and uh, by 1982, it still doesn't have enough states. Uh, it uh, falls three states short of ratification. Now as a CODA, uh, after that uh, 1982 deadline, uh, three states did ratify Nevada, Illinois and Virginia. And just yesterday, uh, Senators Murkowski and Cardin moved to lift the deadline, which suggests that, you know, we might actually see the federal uh, ERA actually recognized. Uh, now, that's a little more contentious. I'm happy to talk about that uh, later. But my main point here is that in derailing the ERA debate into the states, uh, we see a situation in which state constitutional reform actually prevents ratification of the National Amendment, uh, effectively to the extent that gender discrimination is constitutionally forbidden to the extent that gender equality clauses are entrenched or protected. Uh, it's not under the federal constitution. Uh, while there are some judicial rulings that allow uh, intermediate scrutiny of, uh, of uh, gender distinctions for the sort of stronger strict scrutiny standard, you really have to look to the state constitutions. Um, now, you know whether this is normatively justified, whether this is a good or bad outcome, I, you know, is, uh, I think worth discussing, but the important lesson here is that it was state constitutional reform that took this issue off of the national agenda uh, where it had been through the 1970s and effectively uh, stopped uh, attempts at national constitutional reform. So what does all of this tell us? What does the example of the 19th Amendment tell us? What does the example of the ERA tell us? State constitutions matter, right? They're idiosyncratic. There have been hundreds of them. They're hundreds of thousands of pages long. So why wade into them? Why study them at all? After all, it seems like the federal amendments, you know, there are these grand amendments, the 13th Amendment, uh, important decisions like Harper versus Virginia Board of Elections or Brown versus Board that might seem to be worth receiving the lion's share of scholarly attention. And my point here is not that the federal amendments that the federal Supreme Court decisions don't matter or that the federal constitution doesn't matter, but it's that we study these things in isolation. We're not really understanding how they happened in the first place. My argument is that in studying state constitutional reform, we can better understand national constitutional change. Or to put it another way, if you want to fully understand American political or constitutional history, you have to first study state constitutionalism. So that concludes the talk part. Uh, with that, I welcome any questions. Thank you. We're gonna unmute ourselves. Connor, you're muted. Oh, I hate that mistake. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, I was complimenting Robinson, so I'll just do it again uh, quickly. What, di what didn't come across, um, and what those of you who will see the book will see, is just how sweeping the historical coverage is and the depth uh, of, of what we political scientists like of the data that he brings to bear. Uh, really, the historical yeoman's work that he's done on the record of amendments, um, and we just get the surface of that here. So it's just it's very impressive in that respect. Um, I, uh, as we move to the questions, I just want to invite everyone to either uh, raise your Zoom hands or throw some questions into the chat. We've already got some very good ones. Um, I'm going to exercise my, my prerogative uh, of, of asking the first, just to invite Robinson to say a little bit further uh, on one of two topics. So this is a choose your own adventure. Um, it also gives me a chance to push him on things that we've talked about in the past uh, that I know he cares about. Um, so the, the first has to do with um, what it, I'll just, Put it this way, what accounts for the veneration gap between state constitutions and the national constitution? 
uh, in one respect, it seems like we, we treat state constitutions very shabbily <laughs> as things that can be changed at will. And the US constitution as a sacred text that shouldn't be changed. I think you actually show how the value of treating something actually instrumentally like the rest of the world tends to treat constitutions. Uh, but that doesn't explain this kind of political culture that's, that's risen up around it. So what explains the, uh, the, the posture of the, the constitutional politics around that uh, having to do with the veneration of one constitution, but really not the other? That question, feel free to take, or the other one being, um, you expressed your argument, I think about halfway through, uh, and said that uh, state constitutionalism makes American politics work, which makes sense. There's a, right, it's a functionalist account. It'd be kind of surprising if we would be where we are in American history and the reverse were true. So I'm, I'm very, very persuaded of that. But then you said kind of as a, or either, uh, rephrasing it or uh, reorienting it, uh, that it makes American politics more legitimate. Uh, and those strike me as, as quite different claims. I know they're both claims that, that you have thoughts on. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, maybe to invite you on, on the legitimacy point, just to elaborate uh, a little bit further. Yeah, well, thank you, John. I'll, I'll try to actually answer both of these. Um, on the veneration gap, so why do we see this? You know, we, we know that Americans do venerate the national constitution. Uh, if you've ever been to the National Archives, it's sort of a mausoleum to the constitution, famously, you know, for those of y'all that are fans of the um, national treasure franchise, you'll know that the document descends into the floor into a bomb-proof vault nightly. And I think that's a good analogy, right? The constitution is untouchable both physically and, and legally. It's almost impossible to amend. It's not just the high Article 5 barriers, it's that Americans don't really want to change the document, but state constitutions are very different. And part of that is just pure ignorance. Again, only 52% of Americans think state constitutions exist, about half of Americans think they don't exist. Uh, and those that are aware of them are fine with changing them. Um, so, you know, again, because these documents are always amended, they get stuck in this feedback loop in which it becomes easier just to add another amendment to the document. Louisiana has had, uh, it's either 11 or 13 constitutions, um, partly because it has this long French civil law tradition, uh, 11 documents. Uh, and that was enough for a Louisiana historian to quip, quote, that constitutional revision in Louisiana, whether in convention or by amendment, has been so continuous as to justify including it alongside Mardi Gras, football, and corruption as one of the premier, premier components of state culture. The culture, you know, to the extent that it exists, is one of change at the state level. Uh, people don't care, and if they care, they want to add another amendment to their constitution, uh, and they do it by the thousands and thousands. Um, but so what does all of this tell us, right? So I said state constitutionalism makes U.S. politics work, and I said that it makes it more legitimate. Um, it makes U.S. politics work, but it makes it work pretty poorly. So federalism is extraordinarily inefficient, right? What we're doing is we're splitting authority between 50 different lawmaking bodies. If you want vaccine rollout, it's going to happen really slowly and with a lot of inequality. That's what we're dealing with now. If you want to overturn the results of a democratic, fair, corruption-free election, you're probably not going to be able to pull it off because, as you said, say, uh, president, you don't have authority over state elections. This splitting of authority uh, means that it's really hard to get something done successfully whether that is you know, a vaccine rollout or an attempt to overturn an election. It means again that change is slow, gradual, haphazard, uh, and it sort of pumps the brakes on a lot of the stuff, good and bad, um, that, that occurs at the national level. Um, but what about legitimacy, right? So I think state constitutions, and here I have this kind of Jeffersonian bent, uh, give us the democratic legitimacy that we don't get from the national constitution. Uh, so. We as you know, American citizens don't have the right to change the national constitution. We can call a convention of people who can think about an amendment, which they might pass to send to another set of conventions or legislators who can also decide to ratify or reject that. Or we can elect members of Congress to send that to other people who can then ratify or reject it in convention or legislature, but we don't have the right to actually change the constitution ourselves. We can reinterpret it if we want. We can you know, elect people who pick the judges to reinterpret it, but we don't actually get to touch our own constitutions to affect them, to revise them, uh, unless it's at the state level. And there it's extraordinarily easy, right? And if we believe that democratic legitimacy requires flexibility in the laws in response to democratic pressures, and I think there's good sort of background in our uh, the American political tradition to interpret uh, democratic legitimacy that way. 
If we think that's what democratic legitimacy is, then you can't find that at the national level. You can only find it at the state level because states have the mechanism for ongoing and easier constitutional change. They allow mechanisms in which people you know, can vote on amendments directly and people can even write amendments that get into the state constitutions. This happens a lot. Now, granted, those people are usually lobbyists, but it's still maybe a little more democratically legitimate than say members of Congress writing uh, amendments. So that, that's sort of my, my tag on the legitimacy thing, although I'd be curious to you know, get feedback or thoughts. Um, other questions? Where about the veneration gap? Good thing to kind of ask. Yeah, I, I tried to address that at, at the uh, beginning and uh, maybe I guess to clarify it, right? Some of it's just plain ignorance uh, and that Americans don't quite know uh, that they have state constitutions and therefore can't care about them. Um, I also think though Madison's line, right, uh, in, in the Federalist, he says, uh, right, time grants uh, this patina of veneration uh, or bestows that on everything, right? And so because the Constitution, the federal Constitution is the world's oldest because it's been uh, amended so infrequently, we've been uh, almost 40 years since Congress uh, actually passed an amendment and sent it to the states for ratification. Uh, because of those sort of long delays, I think Americans uh, are aware of their federal constitution and uh, less likely to want to change it. Um, whereas again, you know, uh, at the state level, they just don't have the information to oppose uh, or sometimes even support an amendment. So some of it, I think, comes down to sort of public awareness of these things. Which suggests that in this internet era, it's going to get, that doesn't seem like that's probably going to get better. Written in terms of what legit, I mean, I guess the thing that's that's striking to me is that you, what you say is obviously quite true when you start to think about it. Uh, but the fact that no one, but the fact that all the focus goes to these national things and it's probably going to keep going to these national things makes you wonder how this is, uh, what this means for the future. What, what do you what do you think it means for the future? Since you're a social scientist, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm not a, I'm not the prognosticating kind, uh, and so you know, I, I should say I don't know in part because I don't know. Um, I the one thing I can say right is, is that state constitutions are because they're so much easier to change uh, than the national constitution, and because that has remained a constant through all the sort of fluctuation in the actual content of state constitutions. Um, I don't expect them to sort of break out of the, the feedback loop in which they're stuck, in which, you know, the amendments beget amendments. One of the reasons I called it path dependent is I think because, you know, amendments often are drafted very quickly to the state constitutions in haphazard ways that require repeal by amendment or then reinstitution by another amendment. And so each amendment will spur more amendments, which is why state constitutions have hundreds or thousands of amendments. Uh, because those mechanisms have remained pretty stable and because the barriers to formal change have remained fairly low, uh, I don't expect this sort of uh, pattern to change. And I don't expect state constitutions soon to start looking like the federal one and earning the federal, uh, the veneration the federal constitution um, has. So that's, that's sort of a, a short uh, answer to the veneration question. <laughs> Well, so we have several good questions from uh, other political scientists. We, I think we, we usually let the, let a, when we get the open Q and A, we usually let a student go, go first. So I think I'll let us, uh, we'll call on one of the students and Morgan, you had said he had a clarification and then the Tyron had a question. So Morgan, do you still have you, did you, has your clarification been clarified? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it was kind of answered um, from okay. Dr. Ewing's questions. But I think what I was, I'm not a political scientist by trade, I am very much into history, um, but I thank you for this talk. I've been screaming for the past few years to care about your state politics. Um, so this was, this was very interesting to me. And I think what I'm maybe not quite making the jump to is you provide like a lot of explanation and a lot of evidence that these state constitutions matter and that they influence, they can influence the federal government and the national constitution. But I think I'm kind of missing the step between how does that like stabilize the constitution? Because if the idea is that federal constitution is really hard to amend, isn't that already, like I guess, isn't that already stabilized? I've just, I don't think I'm quite making it there in my, log like in my logic. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that I keep asking. Um, so Article 5 means we have the world's uh, most difficult to amend constitution. And not incidentally, we don't have that many amendments. And the story should probably end there. And for a lot of people, it does. Um, one of the funny things, though, is that constitutions, which are harder to amend, tend to break rather than bend. Uh, it's flexibility that grants national constitutions longevity. <laughs> so um, this work by uh, scholars Elkins, Melton, and, Gin and Ginsburg, it's a comparative work, looks at all national constitutions and finds that the hardest to amend constitutions have the shortest lives. And the, they mention in passing that the US has the world's most difficult to amend constitution. So why has it survived? Article five does do a lot of the work, right? But in effectively stopping or preventing national change, but that pressure has to go somewhere. And so it's Article 5 in combination with venting to the states that I think allows it. But I, I think you also have this sort of other like uh, important uh, direction in your question, right? Which is that sometimes the national constitution does change, right? And I talked about one case, the 19th Amendment. I think even when the national constitution is amended, usually it's done in a way that backs up former or prior state constitutional change. So it's not that the, the constitution isn't stable because it never gets amended, but rather because uh, rather that because when those amendments do pass, uh, they tend to build on and harmonize with prior state constitutional reform in ways that make the amendments more stable, precedented. Uh, even if you look at the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, which dictated federal policy on non-compliant uh, states that kept electing ex-Confederates in the South, even these actually built on some state constitutional reforms passed by uh, radical Republicans at the state level in the South. Uh, so even in that moment of extreme sort of federal power, right, uh, reforming and, and uh, building a multi-ethnic democracy, uh, we also see uh, state constitutionalism sort of helping to uh, stabilize national politics. Uh, so hopefully more than that, I answered your question. It did, thank you. And um, if I, while I have the platform, I'm just going to remind my fellow Missouri residents that we will have it on the ballot in 2022 if we will be having a constitutional convention. Wow, who's, well, I'll, I'll ask you some other time, Morgan, who's calling that one? That's all, that would, that would be key, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, so we have, uh, I had made a cue here, uh, Tyron. Another student, and then, then then there are some political scientists lining up, lining up to, uh, to to go on the. I don't sure it's an attack or what. Tyron, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Perfect. Um, hi, thank you for this talk. I just wanted to ask. You outline your puzzle at the beginning of why has the constitution been so long lasting and resilient, but do you not think there's perhaps a much easier answer to the question, being that the constitution is just fundamentally a living document. Like it reminds me a bit of um, Thurgood Marshall's speech on the bicentennial of the Constitution, way more or less said, I don't give a damn about this document. It was so broken, it took a civil war to fix it. And, you know, the evolution is far more important than its origins. And like issues like, I don't know, abortion and gay marriage, I mean, those weren't done by amendment. And I don't think you could really explain them by state pressure or how the same document without much formal change can cater to both a small slave state run by white men to this global behemoth with its own imperial domains and a great federal government. So I guess my question is, if the constitution can expand and contract so much as to become more or less a brand new document, is it really worth boasting or kind of seeking to explain its longevity, even if technically it is the same piece of paper in the National Archives? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, for the record, I think we should be on our like ninth constitution by now. I, uh, I fully buy um, uh, Howard alum, uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall's argument against the constitution in 1988 as I buy um, uh, William Lloyd Garrison's claim in 1940, uh, 1845 that it was um, uh, you know, a covenant with death and an agreement by hell. Uh, 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 but, uh, you know, the fact is we've been stuck with this one document which creates all kinds of problems. Um, <clears throat> it's a living document, right? So I, I don't think that we have meaningfully the same constitution that we did uh, prior to the 13th Amendment. That constitution was a constitution built to defend the interests of slaveholders. Uh, the constitution that came after was not uh, you know, for its many flaws, a constitution that was pro-slavery. And that's a fundamental change. I, I buy a, a political scientist, Kerry Jacobson's argument that a constitution exists, uh, its identity exists, not really in its text, but it's in its normative commitments, some of which can be in the text, uh, and that our constitution is fundamentally changed in its normative commitments, um, which I think is a good thing. I, I buy living constitutionalism. Uh, living constitutionalism, I think, works partly because of state constitutional reform. So 
take a look at same-sex marriage, most states had constitutionalized or statutorily recognized same-sex marriage. And because of that, uh, in Obergefell versus Hodges, uh, half a decade ago, the Supreme Court said that it could recognize uh, same-sex marriage federally without coercing the states too much. I think that uh, decision passed in part because the states have done the heavy lifting on constitutionalism. Abortion, similarly, right, that's another case. Uh, states have created this patchwork of abortion regulation, allowing access in some places, forbidding it effectively in others, sometimes through constitutional reform. This creates huge normative problems because it means your rights depend on what county you live in or what state you live in. Uh, it's also an extraordinarily stable consensus. I don't think, uh, as a result, we're likely to see uh, strong efforts to repeal grow, despite you know some attempts by particularly outlying states like uh, recently um, Louisiana and Georgia. Uh, what about the growth of the administrative state, right? The United States in the 1930s looks nothing like the United States in the 1830s. Uh, but labor protections, to the extent that they exist in the formal text, only exist in the state constitutions. Uh, in a case, uh, in the Dandridge case, the Supreme Court said that there is no welfare right under the federal constitution, and the constitution's text contains no such protections, but the state constitutions do. In fact, only the state constitutions guarantee welfare rights. Uh, the machinery to do progressive income taxation was born at the state level, and it was that that the, um, um, uh, the IRS first imitated um, in the 1920s. Uh, it's not to say that the states invented the administrative state, but rather they helped the federal administrative state come into being, they helped birth it. Uh, I think, right, partly the reason that the living constitutionalism has, uh, has been functional or, or that we have a living constitutionalism and the constitution in part is because at the state level, we have explicitly changing documents that actually uh, say what it, it means to for, uh, that to happen at the national level. Um, but you know, I, I appreciated the, the Thurgood Marshall uh, shout out, especially because I think right, he gives us a good normative sense of what the Constitution should look like. Uh, some of which, maybe a little bit more than we've noticed, I think is due to state reform. So I appreciate the question, Tehran. Thank you. Okay. I want to come, I'll come back later to the, the idea of constitutions having normative commitments. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, 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 John Dearborn, though, is next in the queue. Call, your, we'd call yourself up, John. Sure. Hi. Um, thanks, Robinson, for this absolutely wonderful presentation. And what a great event, too. Um, so my question is going to pick right back off this about constitutional durability and specifically the idea of adaptability. Um, so I'm curious about um, how you think your book relates to Skronik and Oren's idea of the adaptability paradox in which they're concerned that our very long and successful history of institutional adaptation has perhaps now basically driven us into a corner. Um, from my understanding of your book, which I so look forward to reading, um, it seems like state constitutions really are maybe the central mechanism that allows adaptation and the solving or at least dealing with national conflicts to work over time. But my question is, if state politics is perhaps becoming even more reflective of national politics now, is that state function of adaptation going to work as effectively maybe as it has before? That's a question that keeps me up at night. So thank you for that, John. I, I, I mean that. It, this is it's something that I, I can't really answer, uh, but I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, I haven't read the New Orleans and Skronik book, uh, although you know I, I can say as a graduate student, I read both of them religiously. Uh, so I, I don't want to phrase this in response to their specific book, but rather to kind of the second half of your question. Uh, we know that state politics is looking more and more like national politics, right? So there are people like um, Joe Manchin in, in uh, West Virginia, a Democrat who wins re-election in a deep red state, or John Tester in Montana doing the same thing. But that's really kind of the deviation. And the norm is homogenization. Red states are getting redder, not only in Congress, but in their state legislatures. Uh, Dan Hopkins, the political scientist, did a really good book called The Increasingly United States, explaining exactly how this is and why it works. Uh, you know, it's partly because of the nationalization of news media partly because of increasing polarization means people are less likely to jump from one party or another. So what does this mean, right? If national institutions are increasingly deadlocked, we know Congress is like razor thin margins split 50-50 between the parties and hyper-polarized, nowhere near passing an Article 5 amendment. Uh, if states start to look like this, does this mean that states are going to become less functional, just like the national uh, Congress does? Um, 
I, I was sort of concerned that was the case. And there was a, there's another state constitution scholar, John Dinan, who put out a book in 2019 called State Constitutional Politics. And he says, it's so easy to amend state constitutions that because most states require a simple majority, you're just gonna keep getting amendments. And what'll happen is, you know, a party will have a 51 seat, 51% uh, uh, majority in both chambers and just rework the entire constitution. And in parties, you know, in states where there's, uh, there's party competition, another state could come in and rework the constitution through a new set of amendments. So you'll probably keep seeing constitutions that just get longer and longer at the state level, but not necessarily more functional, right? The reason state constitutionalism to some degree has been functional is because at the state level, state legislative politics was at least kind of functional. There was sort of inter-party compromise. And as that starts declining, I think uh, the change will continue, but I'm not sure we'll see something like coordinated change and we'll start to see documents that are maybe at war with themselves. Um, but, you know, I, I followed John Dynan's work in saying that the amendments are just going to keep coming. Uh, and that itself is, is to some degree good news, right? It means that the venting process is still working at least a little bit, uh, even as national politics is increasingly sclerotic and, and bound by constitutional hardball. I uh, appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, so Rudy, I think, was next. Hi, Ro <clears throat> Hi Robinson. Um, Hi, uh, I was uh, thinking about your talk, and it seemed to me that you said, really were saying the real action in the American Constitution is in the states, right? A and that that's the, de the place where we have democratic legitimacy. But at the same time, you seem to be saying no one knows anything about their state constitutions. There's 300 pages <laughs> long. 50% of the population doesn't even know they have a state constitution. Uh, it's dominated by interest groups and lobbyists. Are you really saying there is no democratic legitimacy and that basically the real action happens among elites in the states? Yeah, that's a great question. I turned in uh, the last set of page proofs for this book earlier today, which you'd asked me this morning. <laughs> so I'll try to answer it knowing the book uh, can't exactly answer it perfectly. Um, I have a really low bar for legitimacy, right? I, I think that if uh, a simple majority of people attempt constitutional change and achieve it, that is legitimate. And there are a whole lot of reasons to say that's a bad definition, but I would say that this is maybe more legitimate than when you require super majorities that are unattainable that kind of look like you have consensus, but effectively actually silence change or prevent change and prevent consensus building in the first place because it's impossible. The three quarters ratification threshold for federal amendments just means people don't try anymore. Uh, Arkansas uh, Senator Dale Bumper um, said that proposed constitutional amendments are quote, patent nonsense. Members of Congress just propose them to take positions in front of their constituents now, knowing they'll all fail. Uh, and so I think, right, the three quarters supermajority is just too high. I think because states have it lower, you can see simple majorities of, of voters actually pass amendments, and that's legitimate. Now, in an ideal world, voters would know what they're voting for, and even at the state level, they don't. Uh, and so I, I don't think, right, it, it's legitimate, but not necessarily informed. Uh, and while I would like to see informed democracy, I'm, I'm really kind of just settling for that fair threshold of what legitimacy might look like uh, in terms of getting an informed population, you know, that that's a project or what that would look like is beyond my own expertise. Um, but thank you for a question that I wish I'd answered in the book. Yep, so someone, someone, someone uh, should ex explain to, Ro to tell Robinson about the, uh, the clean Missouri find followed by the cleaner Missouri or whatever they, that actually reversed clean Missouri. Those were two two different things that were passed the last two elections, I think, here. Uh, uh, so uh, Jay Sexton, I think, would be next in the queue that I have. I'd, I'd, so I'd like to have another student question or two, but Jay's the, Jay asked me the next I think person. Claire just had a question. Claire Smirt, I can wait after her. Okay, Claire. Okay, I'll Claire. go ahead. Go. Um, hi, thank you again uh, for talking with oh, us. Oh, sorry. I'm Oh, I was wondering in your research, did you come across any distinct patterns of change in state constitutions when the party in control of the state legislators was different than the one in control of the national legislator? So for example, right now, after the 2020 election cycle, there are more uh, Republican held state houses, but there's democratic control of Congress. So have you seen that there's been a greater incentive to change state constitutions in these types of times? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if you can't get through Congress, you go where you can. And if 
states are amenable, uh, you know, states are controlled by parties, uh, a party that you, uh, that's not controlling Congress, you look to the states first. Um, so that's kind of what I, I was trying to get across with the 19th Amendment is, you know, congressional um, members of Congress just weren't interested in female enfranchisement. A few were, uh, a member named James Brooks thought about it, uh, Charles Sumner in the 1860s. But by the 1860s, 70s, 80s, particularly in the West, where you know these new states want to attract female settlers, um, <clears throat> members of the state legislatures are amenable to the female franchise that keeps getting shut down in Congress. Uh, by the 1890s, 1910s, right? It's not just that these Western states are trying to uh, pump up their population with uh, female settlers, but also that there's this sort of progressive uh, spirit of experimentation. There are populist movements also in the Midwest, and so. They're, these actually organize as parties. The Populist Party, uh, which forms at the state level, supports female franchise, whereas the two national parties in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s don't, right? Uh, in uh, 1908, um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt says, again, go get another state. The next year, uh, William Howard Taft says, we're not doing it. Republicans are opposed. Democrats only flip in 1917, but it's the Populist Party at the state level that listens. And so the answer is yes, right? If you're blocked by the national legislature and the, by the party that controls the national legislature, you look to the party at the state level that will listen. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right there, Claire. Thank you. Jay, I think it's up to, I think it's to you next. I'm trying, wait. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah. So, um, oh, thank you for that. I enjoyed that. I think I'm rather inclined to um, agree with your with your hypothesis or your, your thesis there. And um, even though I don't like the uh, state constitutions being like big fat phone books, um, as you say, I mean, if anything, it's almost that the state constitutions these days resemble like a British style unwritten constitution that just policy with some convention structure, everything smooshed together. We got that at the states and then at the at the national level, we got the written constitution. So maybe it's the best of both of, of both worlds. So I, I suppose I agree with it. And I particularly agree that it, one good thing, if there is a good thing about the Trump era, is that it reminded the American left that federalism has a place, is a good thing. And, and I thought you made that point well too. But uh, historically, I guess my question is the obvious one. So you probably have an answer, but I, I see how your, your argument works for the 19th Amendment. Um, it doesn't seem like it works for the slavery question and the breakdown of the union. I mean, that, that's a situation in which the state constitutions kind of bifurcate into a kind of an internal cold war and 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 the and the triggers about the bloody state constitution in Kansas it, that's not a good thing for the polity so i guess what what's your what's your answer i mean the civil war doesn't fit your your thesis and that seems like a pretty big pretty big exception yeah and you're absolutely right uh, state constitutionalism helps force the civil war uh, and my argument is also that state constitutionalism led reconstruction in ways that maybe we've missed uh, and that second thing might be a little contentious but uh, you know i want to first give credit to uh, your point kansas bleeding kansas was really about state constitutionalism they passed four constitutions in four years uh creating two separate governments which are at war with each other and this actually happened a fair amount in the 1840s. Uh, Rhode Island, uh, under what was called the Door War, had dueling constitutions and governments, which actually led the Supreme Court in 1849 to you know, pass uh, to uh, rule that uh, political question doctrine that, that these sorts of issues were beyond their authority to hear. But uh, bleeding Kansas couldn't be ignored, right? And it actually brings you know fighting to the floor of Congress. Um, and it, it, it's incompatible state constitutional orders that I think leads partly to the Civil War. Northern states under their state constitutions have these broad liberty clauses, which judges start applying to uh, fugitive enslaved people. Uh, they start passing statutory personal liberty laws, uh, which Southern states see as a front to their, um, their uh, takings, uh, constitutional takings clauses forbidding the uncompensated taking of property. These Northern states are taking what they see as, as human property. Uh, and it, it's just this irreconcilable order, this Cold War, as you put it, that leads to the Civil War. Uh, it is state constitutionalism that also uh, works out what 
the post Civil War order looks like, right? So the Civil War is, is settled not legal, uh, through you know legal measures, but through the force of arms, uh, and thankfully it leads to the morally just conclusion. And then this question becomes, well, what does legal reconstruction look like? And members of Congress, even in the 1860s, even radical Republicans like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner say, we cannot dictate state level law. We cannot force a positive recognition of the right of black people to vote in the United States. We can merely forbid its denial. And that looks good, but they also realize they're not gonna get an amendment pass on willing states. And so they force Southern state reconstruction right through the military reconstruction acts eventually. Uh, and what Southern state constitutional reconstruction looks like is actually a lot broader and more aggressive than what the federal amendments look like. Uh, the 13th and 15th amendment really brief, only forbid the denial of a right, the 14th amendment a little bit bigger and more positive in terms of its rights protections. But the state constitutions are capacious. And in addition to doing things that you see in the federal constitution, like uh, forbidding uh, um, enslavement and requiring abolition, they also clarify abolition comes without compensation. And after that, and the 13th amendment, we see Congress imitating that language and states they're uh, ratify um, because they see the 13th Amendment as harmonizing with their existing clauses. Uh, the 14th Amendment states pass near identical sets of amendments for equal protection, um, uh, disenfranchising uh, former Confederates, but actually go a little bit further, allowing interracial marriage, allowing public schooling funded by the states. Uh, a lot of these convention delegates by 1867 and 68 and this sort of second wave of reconstruction conventions are um, black men, sometimes uh, accompanied by white men from the North, right, so-called carpetbaggers. Um, and so you get these at the state level, uh, broadening of the franchise as well, uh, in ways that Congress consciously imitates, right? Congress isn't really sure what the Reconstruction Constitution looks like. Uh, there's sort of this question, do we, can we actually rebuild the Constitution at all? And they start referring to state constitutional conventions and the new documents to say, well, this is what will lead us out of it. And it, it sort of reduces controversy in Congress, not just because you know Congress is made up of radical, uh, radical Republicans, but also because they've got some precedent for what it would look like to build a Reconstruction Amendment from uh, these Southern conventions. So it's not exactly that you know state constitutionalism cleans up its own mess, right? The Civil War was caused by state constitution, um, state constitutional chaos, basically. Uh, and you know that was not resolved by state constitutional reform. It was resolved by the force of arms, but it's uh, in the period of reconstruction that uh, state constitutions effectively are asked to do sort of the first initial work of building a post-war constitutional order. Uh, and con Congress consciously imitates that in ways that suggest these state constitutions sort of helped address national controversies, uh, even 10 years after they caused uh, an irreparable national constitutional controversy. Um, so I, I take your point, and I, I'm not sure I have quite fully answered in the book, but I think we also sort of, my aim is to emphasize ways in which states also help rebuild after the great efforts. Well, uh, yeah, Bob, it's, I, I know you finished your book, so you don't want to hear anything you should have put in, but I mean, it does seem like your argument, if it's just that states, states, uh, state constitutionalism kind of drives constitutional change or something like that, then that works probably in most of the cases. Uh, it's just the safety valve part that 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 gets uh, you know sometimes that worked and then and sometimes it didn't. Uh, uh, Justin Dyer, I think, is the last person who's asked who's asked has a who has a question. I think maybe we can have uh, Justin can ask his or make his question a comment, and then we can uh, wrap up probably. Unless somebody else, or another way to put it is, if you have a question, get it in now because Justin has something to say. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. Robinson, thanks for that talk. Good shout out to Gary Jacobson, who Connor and I both worked with, as you uh, might know. Morgan mentioned earlier the Missouri Constitutional Convention question that goes to voters, and it's every 20 years we have to choose whether to write a new constitution. And every 20 years since the 1940s, we've said no. And I think we'll say no again. And part of the reason is because we're terrified of what we would come up with if we were forced to write it again. And it's just a kind of observation and maybe a bleak one about our confidence in ourselves to do these kinds of things. But in the 1940s, when we wrote our constitution, there's a requirement that there's uh, somebody, two people from each Senate district, and they represent 
um, two different political parties, which in practice means you get one Republican, one Democrat from each Senate district. And so the, the convention delegates were pretty much 50-50 split. And then they chose a, an anti-New Deal Democrat to preside over the convention. And, and they kind of figured it out. They came together. It's the middle of World War II. Most of the young people are away. And they write this constitution. And I just, as a kind of observation, I don't, I don't know if we'd be able to do that today. If we had a 50-50 split convention to come together and uh, it was an enormous expense uh, for the public and it took them a year to do. And, you know, just would we have the patience and willingness to do it? Um, so just an interesting question. We did a, an event with John Dynan about state constitutions and the Missouri constitution in particular. But one of the things that came away from that event, and then I'll go into a, a last question, was that uh, the state constitutions, they're so easy to amend. And the incentive, at least in Missouri, is to, if you're a citizen, you're trying to lead an initiative, you're a lobbyist and you wanna have an initiative petition process, you can uh, propose a statute. And with just a little bit more effort, you can propose an amendment. And the amendment can't be revised by the legislature, but the statute can. And so you just do policy by constitutional amendment, and then it makes it really hard to change it again. Although, as Jeff mentioned, we have dueling amendments trying to change policy in that way. Um, and so maybe this takes me into the question. And it's a question about the difference between the federal model and the state model, where the state model is just this ever-growing document. A lot of policy gets put into it. It's trying to address literally everything that the state has competency to address. You know, you got insurance regulations and stuff about the lottery and you know, all sorts of stuff in the constitution. The federal model is really, really limited. It's hard to amend, but yet, as you say, it in, in practice has been amended quite frequently. I think just as an analytic point, we live under a much different constitutional arrangement than we started out with. And so how do you explain that? And a lot of it, as you point out, comes from judicial interpretation. So here's my, that was my, my long wind up to the question. Uh, what do you see in the difference between state judiciaries and the way that they are involved in or not involved in constitutional interpretation in a creative kind of way that's actually amending the constitution and whether because of the difference between how state constitutions operate and the federal constitution, you actually see less of that. Um, in the way that the federal model empowers judges to perform that function? Yeah, wonderful questions. Um, I'll try to, I'll, I'll go down the order, I think, roughly you asked them. Um, right, so Missouri has, has the regular uh, convention call, which 14 different states do, and uh, I'll give a shout out to another uh, Texan, uh, Sandy Levinson, who with William Blake, uh, yet another uh, U-Texas uh, grad, showed that states are just ignoring these provisions now. Um, you know, so some states will either call the uh, have the vote for the convention and then uh, it either gets shut down or some states are simply refusing to uh, follow up on their constitutionally mandated convention call at all. Uh, and that really, it, it sort of points to dampening of, the, of wholesale constitutional replacement. So one thing I tried to do in the book is just build this database of all 412 attempts to write these state constitutions. And replacement really, it, it ends around the early 20th century, right? There's an uptick again in the mid 20th century uh, in which states write entirely new constitutions during the civil rights movement, really to reapportion their legislatures after uh, Supreme Court decisions, Baker versus Carr, Westbury versus Saunders, Reynolds versus Sims. Um, but for the most part, states aren't replacing their constitutions anymore. And so, you know, uh, to John Dynan's point, as you also, um, you know, as you put it, Justin, they're governing by amendment. I think that's the subtitle of, of Dynan's recent book. Um, you know, th that also coincides with a get decline, as John pointed out, in bipartisanship and in legislatures. You know, th there was this period in the 1940s in which some states, uh, Georgia was one, uh, they had this moderate governor, Ellis Arnold. 1945, they tried to draft a new constitution based on sort of moderate apolitical principles. The National Co uh, Council of State Legislatures uh, is, is trying to, um, you know, in, in the mid 20th century, get involved in this sort of expert governance movement, sort of a revived progressive uh, era. Um, and so, right, you see Missouri coming out of that, a very early form, Nebraska. Um, uh, 
But, you know, that, that kind of sort of apolitical constitutional design of wholesale reform doesn't happen now. You can't build the bipartisan majorities needed to clear the state's admittedly lower bars to wholesale replacement. And so you go by amendment, which requires simple majorities in most states uh, because of partisanship, uh, partly. Uh, sort of one side note um, to sort of give even more credence to uh, Jay's point earlier. Uh, Missouri 1820, that's a constitution, right? That's the fire bell in the night that nearly destroys the union, um, right? Uh, there's in Congress, the Talmadge Amendment, uh, which uh, would have um, uh, brought about abolition. Uh, and Congress very seriously doesn't know what to do about Missouri's constitution. Uh, the answer is they ask states uh, on good faith to um, balance their constitutions as free states and slave states. And states do that, right? Uh, states after Missouri, uh, you know, you get Missouri and Maine, and then you get these paired admissions and state constitutional framers listen to Congress um, and, and sort of maintain the bisectional compromise, even if it's an unjust one. So Missouri, right, sort of is, is an early test, but the states kind of work it out after that uh, in 1820. Um, finally, so what happens to judges, right? If we're governing by amendment, you know, uh, um, if you really want to make sure that something lasts in a legislature, you pass it as a statute, sure, but an amendment's even better because legislature, legislatures are bound by amendment. Uh, and so we get a lot of governing by amendment and judges too are bound by amendment. And in fact, you know, this is something that John Diamond points out, uh, the second half of the 20th century on is governing by amendment and governing judges by amendment. Um, uh, constitutional amendments, you know, have, have long been drafted at the state level, specifically in response to state courts, uh, really reversing state uh, courts uh, policy initiatives. And that happened all through the late 18th century, the 19th century, but it's especially happening now that we rely more on state constitutional amendment in the 20th and 21st century. And judges, as a result, have a much more narrow sense of what they can do. Um, so, right, uh, uh, Gary Jacobson says the Constitution exists in its fundamental principles. Uh, the Nebraska court in a case called Omaha Bank versus Spire says state constitutions don't have fundamental principles. They're just phone books. And because they don't have fundamental principles, state judges can't throw out an amendment as illegal or overriding fundamental principles. Because state judges more or less have recognized state constitutions as phone books, they've given up their ability to create sort of a living constitution through reinterpretation the, to the extent that state constitutions are living documents at all. It's not by judicial reinterpretation. I think this was important to Justin. It's really by amendment. Uh, so I really appreciate the, the, the question there. Thank you. Okay, well, we could, we could go into a whole thing about the Missouri constitution now because we, we've heard quite a bit about that in this uh, venue. Uh, over the over the years, uh, but I think it's about time to quit. So why don't we all uh, actually try to give uh, Robinson and Connor a big hand uh, for that talk? Okay, you turn your sound on. Uh, in next week.